reflect for a moment on the art of cinema. Think of a motion picture like The Last Emperor and the nine Academy Awards it so richly deserved. Consider the profound emotional experience of a truly great film. Then forget it, sweetheart. Yes, better blow it out your exhaust pipe, cinema lover, because here comes fun with hair on it. Oh, that's disgusting. You're going to see the biggest piece of shattering entertainment that ever molested your sensibilities. That sounds great. Hell comes to Frog Town. <laughs> G'day, my name's Chris. My name's Nathan. And this is Cinema Biosis, the show where we talk about films and their strange and oftentimes baffling connections to other forms of media. And today we're talking about the B-movie classic, Hell Comes to Frogtown, starring... Do you... do you hear that, Nathan? Is that... is that bagpipes? But he is an unpredictable man! I like the look of this! There it is! Roddy Piper! There's the Rowdy one! There is Roddy! Roddy Piper! That's right, Hell Comes to Frogtown stars the late, great, Rowdy Roddy Piper. A lot of people probably know him from his career as a professional wrestler, but you and I, Nath, uh, where do we know him from? They Live, one of the greatest movies of all time. It always surprised me Piper wasn't a bigger star, because this is a man born to be an action hero. Roddy likes to fight! Before we get into it, there's two things we need to talk about. Firstly, we have a history with this movie. We selected it randomly from the archive for one of our bad movie nights a little while ago. Yeah, I don't even... I can't even remember where I got this from. I just remember it had um, Rowdy Roddy Piper in it. I was like, we've got to watch this movie. Never heard of it before. Yeah, and it blew us away when we saw it, mostly because we just thought it was so strange. We kept questioning how it got made. More often than not, those random B-movies we stumble across are misfires, but this is certainly not. No! <laughs> so what would you call this film? A post-apocalyptic chauvinistic tale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the second thing we need to talk about. This movie has some problematic portrayals of women in it. There's definitely an element of hypersexualization going on. Hey, you know, you look terrific in this light. See you in the morning. But then again, Piper is sexualized a fair bit as well. And there's a few more things that muddy the waters even more that we'll unpack later on. I just think it's important we acknowledge this isn't the most progressive film by today's standards. Like, I mean, you only have to look at how they dress most of the women characters. The bodyguard on the machine gun and that, she's got like the tightest little crop, no bra, like, and you're just like, hmm, yeah, is that military spec? Shuts your hole! And to be honest, the premise itself is a little problematic because it essentially reads like the script writer's wet dream. How would you describe the plot, Nathan? Honestly, the trailer sums it up pretty well. What a plot? Here it is. It's the end of the 20th century and mankind has blown its wad. <laughs> the fate of humanity rests in the groin of one man. Their leader, Commander Toady, has kidnapped some pilgrims who wandered into their territory. We're gonna get him out, and then you're gonna get him pregnant. So essentially, our story takes place in a post-nuclear apocalyptic world, and there's a man named Hell. Sam Hell. Never heard of you. And because he's one of the only potent men around, he has to accompany a government nurse played by Sandel Bergman from Conan the Barbarian on a mission to try and rescue a group of fertile women who have been captured by Greeners, a group of anthropomorphic frog people. And if the women can't be rescued in time, what does he have to do, Nath? <laughs> He'd be contracted by the government to breed an army. But we're still at war. A population war. Each side is desperate to rebuild and rearm. Now that requires manpower. Manpower requires people. And that's where you come in. One of my notes I made when I was watching the movie is, this is essentially children of men, but made by weirdos with a frog fish. <laughs> 
you could take the frog aspect out, tweak this a little, and it could be a really weird porn. Yeah, it's like, like it's a it's like a setup for a porno. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're like oh. someone just threw some action in and went, oh, "Cast Roddy Piper." I also wrote here with the sheer number of detailed animal costumes, they could have called this Mad Max furry row. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've got to say, for a movie with such an absurd plot, there's a weirdly political subtext to the story. The frog people only came to exist due to human nuclear war, and once they had evolved, the humans rounded them up and put them into reservations. Yeah, they, and they set them out to like mine uranium and stuff. Yeah, they're essentially an underpaid workforce, almost slave labour. It's pretty heavy. There's clearly a little bit of social commentary going on. Well, like even the humans call the greeners squid lips, but this, the greeners then call humans flat lip. They have their own derogatory terms towards each other that are very similar, but it's almost mm, like a racial thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all a little bit shallow if you look too closely, but it's nice they're actually trying to go for some depth depth in the script. Although I shouldn't be too surprised, it's not the first time frogs have got themselves wrapped up in something political. You know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm basically very interested in amphibian rights, uh, being a frog, <laughs> being an amphibian American myself. It's not about the party for me, it's about the, about the, about the water, mm. about the swamp, you know, save the swamp. A noble gesture. I find the character of Sam Hell really interesting, because Roddy Piper is such a physical presence, but he's really not a man of action in this movie. He's more like an over-the-top comedic character. Like, he certainly has his moments, but he's not like Arnie in Commando or anything. Yeah, no, he's not throwing punches everywhere and fighting his way out of big groups. He like gets captured pretty easily. Bull just, like, smacks him in the chest and knocks him out. Yeah, he's immediately knocked uh, out. He, he's <laughs> very much incompetent. <laughs> but his heart's in the right place. Yeah, he seems a bit aloof and carefree in the beginning. Don't you take anything seriously? You used to take everything seriously. Then they blew it up. Yeah, but then they give him a little bit of backstory to make him sympathetic. It was your wife's, wasn't it? It's my daughter's. That's all I could find. The war was a long time ago. Not for me. Which is a smart, smart move, because in general, this character is a bit of a sleaze bag. I mean, he's going around the countryside, sleeping with as many women as he can and getting them pregnant. <laughs> if they didn't give him a little bit of humanity, then the audience wouldn't be on his side. Tomorrow, on Rock Bottom, he's a foreigner who takes perverted videos of you when you least suspect it. He's Rowdy Roddy Peeper. Oh, that man is sick! It'd be a crime if we didn't mention Sandel Bergman as Nurse Spangle, by the way. She does a great job dealing with some weird, weird scenes. Like the Dance of the Three Snakes. That's Ugh, the, yeah. How would you describe that one, Nathan? Um... You have aroused the Three Snakes! Oh, that's disgusting. I love how she just goes on to kick him in the groin after that dance. I like how she kicks him three times just to emphasize that she's kicked him. <laughs> One for each snake. <laughs> in general, Sandel Bergman's character is one of the only competent people in the universe of the film. She just kicks ass and takes names. Yeah, she is more of a hero than what hell is, really. She saves the ladies, saves the day. She's the one that's um, leading the whole troop. But that's just part of this movie's weirdness. It's got this exploitative element, especially when it comes to women. But then the main bad guy is an outright misogynist. Because some guy knocked up his daughter. Yeah, because he sees his daughter as property and now thinks she's been soiled. You see, this used to be a man's world, Sam. But now there are too many women. 
that have us by the short hairs. You know, if you ever get out from under the skirts of the med techs, I'll be there. It really shouldn't be surprising this movie is a little tonally weird, as it had a bit of a troubled production. The direction is technically credited to two directors, who had never worked with each other before and haven't worked with each other since, which is not a good sign. I mean, having two directors doesn't always mean a bad film. No, it can work. But only if they want to work together, which is not the case with Frogtown. The film was very much the baby of Donald G. Jackson, who was one of the directors, but the studio was scared he was too inexperienced to work with the budget, which was considered reasonably high for the type of movie being made, especially when it had a name as ludicrous as hell comes to Frogtown. <laughs> At this point, Jackson's most well-known work was a movie called Rollerblade from 1986 about rollerblading nuns fighting a fascist government in the future. Oh my god. In this realm of blood and lust, automobiles are rusting hulks, and roller skates are the only escape from ruthless ravagers. Witness the clash of two forces in a cataclysmic duel that explodes in an exciting climax of raw power and passion. Experience the ultimate futuristic fantasy adventure on wheels. Roller Blade from New World Pictures. But the studio that was financing the movie saw Frogtown as having sequel potential. So they wanted it to be a success, particularly if they were investing all of this money. So they enlisted the help of someone with directing experience. Well, I mean, they said that person had directing experience, but the biggest credit to their name at this point uh, was that they had directed the US-based inserts for Godzilla 1985. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, Godzilla films have a tradition of having American scenes shot additionally and then edited into the movie for the American release. Oh, that's, that's so funny. I mean, I'm a big fan of Godzilla because they're the worst parts of those movies. Oh, they're definitely the worst parts. <laughs> oh, and Colonel, we've got to find somebody who knows something about what the hell we're dealing with. And the two of them did not get along while they were filming. And there's a lot of great info you can find on the net about the situation, and I'll link a great article in the description below. But what really interests me is what happened after the movie was released. So the studio definitely got their sequels, but perhaps they weren't exactly what they had in mind. So for certain, I know there were two sequels to Hell Comes to Frogtown, but there also might be five sequels to make six movies in total. What? <laughs> uh, you told me the other day that there was a sequel. I'm like, there's a sequel? You're like, yeah, man, there's like two. I'm like, really? Like, yeah. Up to five? <laughs> I've done a bit more research now and it's... Getting a little confusing, I'll say that much. So there's definitely a movie called Return to Frogtown, or sometimes Frogtown 2, which came out in 1992, starring Robert Zadar as Hell. What? Yeah, and I, I don't know why the returning director Jackson picked him, because honestly, Robert Zadar is mostly known for his villainous roles. It's what he's famous for. I can do anything I want, and you can't do a goddamn thing about it. But then things get a little weird, even for a series about giant talking frogs. So under the name Maximo T. Bird, Jackson, the original director of Frogtown and Frogtown 2, started to direct a semi-remake or reimagining of Hell Comes to Frogtown with a man named Scott Shaw, who was working under the name Jake Blade, which is suitable as this Scott Shaw bloke was also starring in a bunch of what seems like spin-offs of Rollerblade from 1986, including movies called The Rollerblade 7, Legend of the Rollerblade 7, and Return of the Rollerblade 7. Before this remake or reimagining of Frogtown could be finalised by the filmmakers, however, distributors released it under the name Toad Warrior in 1996 as an obvious tribute to Mad Max. And this was most likely due to some kind of contract shenanigans. I'm struggling to find the you know, exact it details. It took me too long to figure out Toad Warrior, Road Warrior. <laughs> like, I was like, what do you mean Mad Max? <laughs> like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Look, 
I know, I know that this is confusing because it is definitely hard to follow. I essentially had little notes all around my room like I was solving a series of murders to figure this out. What the hell are you talking about? This company is... Release the film Toad Warrior. And I got a paper trail to prove it. Check this out. Take a look at this! Jesus Christ, Charlie. That right then this remake reimagining was actually finalized by the filmmakers and re-released in 2002 as Max Hell Frog Warrior with no punctuation. So Max Hell Frog Warrior. And now things get even hazier and even weirder because there are also technically films by the same directors called Max Hell in Frogtown 2008 which is a short film with the same cast of Max Hell Frog Warrior, and I could only assume it's cut content from that shoot. Yeah. But then there's also Max Hell Frog Warrior, a rough Zen cut from 2015. Max Hell the Frog Warrior, a Zen silent flick from Date Unknown. And allegedly, according to people online, there is another version called Max Hell Frog Warrior, a Zen speed flick but I can't really find any more info about that release. So, is Mac, Max Hell, is it meant to be his son, his brother? It's allegedly a loose reimagining. But because of Mad Max, they went Max Hell. Oh my god. I didn't even notice they'd changed the name. These movies are breaking my brain, <laughs> What's a Zen flick, you might be asking, Nathan? Because that comes up repeatedly. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. I was like, what's Zen flick? The information I can find online for Zen filmmaking is pretty much limited to Scott Shaw's website and the Wikipedia page for Toad Warrior. And the latter has no reference from where the info came from, so I can only assume the filmmakers or someone close to them wrote it. <laughs> This style of filmmaking, no scripts are used. Instead, a rough plot is outlined, including the basic scenes and locations, and then the crew and actors improvise the rest. All dialogue and action is spontaneous, and entire plot points, scenes, and set pieces are formulated on the spot. Shaw and Jackson have claimed the technique offers freedom of creativity, allowing for very natural performances from actors and a unique artistic outcome. <laughs> <laughs> we have to see this movie. <laughs> Look, we can make fun of the idea, but Shaw honestly seems like a pretty interesting guy if you read up on him. And he does have a little more info about Zen filmmaking on his website. He also has quite a few books on the topic as well if you're keen, and I'm thinking I might pick one up soon to have a bit of a read. To be honest, a lot of his films don't look like they're for me. I prefer my genre stuff to have more structure, but kudos to him for getting out there and giving it a go. Making movies isn't easy, and he's made a hell of a lot of them. If you think his work is something you'd be interested in purchasing, make sure you visit his website, which I've linked in the description below. No private barters allowed in Frog Town! Cody's Law! Oh, bloody hell, man. I think <laughs> we got through them all. I think that's every sequel. I don't know how we did it, but that's all of them. Hi, folks. I know I don't normally appear on camera for these cinema biosis reviews, but there's something I thought I had to share. So I was editing uh, the Hell Comes to Frogtown review, which you can see on my timeline here, when I jumped over to Google just to search up a few things to confirm a few details. And would you believe it? I actually found something I missed. There's a new Max Hell Frog Warrior movie coming out called The Return of Max Hell Frog Warrior. So this is a trailer for it. Um, and you know, I didn't see it. I didn't find it because it's not listed on the IMDb page. It's not listed on the Wikipedia. And I just, I just don't know what to think anymore. Honestly, looking all of this up has broken my brain a little bit. And I thought I was done with it. But here I am. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. So, Chris, would you recommend Hell Comes to Frogtown? Look, this movie definitely has its issues, but there's a lot to like. There's some good world building that's developed through the visuals, like signs that are up around in the buildings and things like that. And there's also a lot of dialogue that tells the backstory of the world. The effects are awesome for the budget, and overall, the movie is pretty fun. I think it's a great one to watch with some mates and a few beers. Would you recommend it? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Want to get anything from it? The acting that the Greeners do with their voice acting is amazing. I want something to bolster the sagging attendance. Something with real showmanship. It is real fun. There are a lot of cringy moments. They're like, oh, that wouldn't fly today. But, yeah, no, it's definitely enjoyable. I mean, if you had said, I do not suggest this, Nathan, I would have been extremely surprised. <laughs> 
<laughs> because I don't know if this is information you want shared, but how many times did you watch this movie in a three-day span, Nathan, for this review? <laughs> yeah, I've watched it twice, and I started watching it again last night and decided to watch something else. <laughs> <laughs> if that isn't a recommendation, I don't know what is. Oh, I guess what they say is true. What's that? A soldier's work is never done. Thanks for watching folks, if you enjoyed this video make sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Twitter by clicking the link in the description below. If you're after more reviews like this one, Nathan and I recently spoke about Alien 2. No, not James Cameron's Aliens, but the real Alien 2, from Italy. To find that one, just click on the thumbnail at the end of this video. Until next time, stay safe and stay weird.